Hello, hello, can people hear me? Uh, if there are any seats in the middle, if you guys can move in, we're a little bit uh, crowded for seating, and um, I'm very sorry to make this announcement, but at a certain point we will have to ask for some people to go home and uh, watch it on stream because the university has been giving us some problems and we just ran out of seatings. I'm so sorry to ask that of some people, but uh, I'm so glad that all of you guys have turned out to show up and watch Frank. But uh, if we can just uh, find some spare seats, get as many people seated. Oh, hello. hello. Okay, that cut out for a second. Uh, if we can just get some as many people seated, and uh, a, f a few people can stand. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Hello there, uh, once again. Okay, so uh, we are having an overflow party. Head, keep okay. Overflow party. Head back to the Biblical Study Center to where it will be streamed there for, and there will be seat, extra seating there. And you can find Bill Publes in. You can find Bill. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. You, uh, you guys can find Bill Publes in the back, and he'll be leading uh, overflow uh, back to the Biblical Study Center. So, it, would it be okay if we delayed five minutes to let people get over there, or we can start and? They can. They can see it as it's. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Anyway, uh, we're gonna hopefully get started here. So. My name is Michael Person. I'm with Rashio Christie, and we are hosting Dr. Frank Turek. And there will be a Q&A at the end of it. Good evening. Well, good evening, Broncos. I think you guys eclipsed the University of Buffalo last week. You know, one week ago, 1,991 years ago, it is alleged that the greatest event in human history took place 
And that is the resurrection of Jesus. Alleged. The question is, did it really happen? That's what I want to investigate tonight. And I want to start on September 29th, 2006. That's when Petty Officer Michael Monsor is a United States Navy SEAL operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Monsor is standing on a roof in Ramadi, and he's standing in front of a doorway to this roof. He has two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position at his feet. They've already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they're not exactly sure where the enemy is. There's a bit of a lull in the fighting. Insurgents have blocked off the streets in Ramadi, and there's someone on the loudspeaker in the town mosque yelling, Kill the Americans! As Monsor and his team are looking for the next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location throws a grenade up on the roof. It hits Monsor in the chest, and it falls to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there's no opportunity to pick it up and throw it back. He has only a split second to make a decision. He can leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he does, his two teammates lying at his feet will surely die. Monsor yells, Grenade! But instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumps forward chest first onto the grenade. It detonates. 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Monsor is dead. His two teammates lying at his feet receive only minor injuries because Monsor's body muffled the blast. One of the survivors said at Monsor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you will not take my friends, I will go in their stead. I've never seen a United States president cry until April of 2008. That's when President George W. Bush invited Monsor's parents into the East Room of the White House to give them their son's Medal of Honor posthumously. The president couldn't even get through the citation without breaking down. Since then, Monsor's High School in Garden Grove, California built a new stadium. They named it Michael A. Monsor Memorial Stadium. The golden trident insignia that the SEALs wear dominates the 50-yard line. January 2019, North Island, California, just outside of San Diego, the United States Navy commissioned the USS Michael Monsor, the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet. This is Monsor's mother, Sally, being escorted onto the ship, named in honor of her fallen son. Now, why did they do this? Because Michael Monsor literally sacrificed himself to save his friends. There's no greater love than to sacrifice yourself to save your friends, said Jesus of Nazareth before he went to the cross. Michael Monsor sacrificed himself to save his friends. The question is, would anyone sacrifice himself to save you? And the answer is, someone already has. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. But in today's culture, a lot of people don't think the story's true. They think it's invented. After all, it was written down by religious people. We know religious people tend to embellish things. Not only that, it's got miracles in it. Who here in this room has seen someone rise from the dead after you knew they were dead for at least 36 hours? I ask all audiences that, and nobody ever raises their hand. Why? Because it doesn't happen. And if you're a Christian, you have to believe something none of us have ever seen. How rational is that? Well, I actually think it's quite easy to show that Christianity is true. You only need to answer four questions. In other words, if you investigate these four questions, I think you'll realize that the answer to these four questions is yes. And if the answer to these four questions is yes, then Christianity is true. What are the four questions? Here are the four questions.
Now that is some pretty grooving music, isn't it? Yeah. That's actually from our TV show, which is on every Wednesday nights on DirecTV channel 378. If you don't have DirecTV, it's on Roku. And if you don't have Roku, it's on this new technology sweeping Boise right now. It's called the Internet. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah, right there on our website, the show streams live. Here it'd be 7 p.m. in the Mountain Time Zone. We're on radio, a bunch of stations around the country. I don't know if it's here in Boise, but it doesn't matter. It's podcasted. It's called the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. We, uh, we do two a week, actually, and we present evidence for Christianity, and we cross-examine ideas against it. Now, why are these the four questions? Truth, God, miracles, and the New Testament. This is going to serve as our outline here tonight. The first question, does truth exist? Why is that important? Because you hear people saying there's no truth. You got your truth. I got my truth. All truth is relative. You ought not judge. You hear all these claims, right? Well, if there's no truth, Christianity can't be true. Of course, if there's no truth, atheism can't be true either, right? Now, of course, there's truth, ladies and gentlemen. Would you be here at Boise State University if there was no truth? I mean, why do you go to school, right, to learn truth? Uh, why would you read a book if there was no truth? How could you catch someone in a lie if there was no truth? Lies presuppose truth. So we're going to deal with that question first. Second question, does God exist? Obviously, Christianity can't be true if there's no God. I hope to show you tonight through three arguments that God really does exist. You don't need the Bible to know this, even though these arguments are in the Bible. I mean, people knew there was a God long before there was a Bible. You can establish that God exists without any reference to any religious work. Third question, are miracles possible? I just asked you if anyone's seen a resurrection. Nobody has. Yet I hope to show you tonight that not only are miracles possible, but the greatest miracle in the Bible even atheists are admitting the evidence for. We'll see that. Then we're going to get to the key question, is the New Testament true? The New Testament doesn't have a prayer if there's no truth, no God, or no miracles but if truth exists, if God exists, if miracles are possible, then we can see if the New Testament documents and other evidence outside those documents let us know if one event from the ancient world took place. If this event actually did take place, Christianity is true. If it didn't, it's false. What's the event? The resurrection. If Jesus really rose from the dead, game over, Christianity is true. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. As the Apostle Paul himself said to the church at Corinth, he said, if Jesus hasn't risen, your faith is in vain. You know what that means? That Christianity is a worldview you can investigate and discover whether or not it's true. It's not just someone's philosophy. It's built into or it's based on historical events. Did these events occur if they did? Christianity is true. If they didn't, Christianity is false. So, let's start right here at point one. Does truth exist? You guys ready to go? Broncos, you're weak tonight. Are you guys ready to go? Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. Oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, you can show the entire Bible's true. We're not getting into that tonight. We don't have time, but the book gets into it. But let's just start with the question, does truth exist? Now, whenever you start talking about truth, you always have to start with Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right? Because Tom Cruise had him on the witness stand, and he said to him, Colonel, I want the truth. And Nicholson said, Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. We got one guy that got it right. The best of you were wimps. Because he didn't say, you can't handle it. If he said it that way, the movie would have gone nowhere. Here's how he said it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, let's try it again. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, that felt better, didn't that? Didn't you always want to do that in class? <laughs> Professors up here, you can't handle the truth. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that can't handle the truth. They're saying, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative, and by the way, you ought not judge. Well, if you don't get anything outside of what we talk about tonight, what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, I think is the most important thinking skill I've ever learned. And I didn't know it until I was 33 years old. I already had a master's degree, and then I learned it. To show you what a dimwit I was. You know why I didn't know what I'm about to show you right now? Because I never had a course in logic. Who in here has had a course in logic? I mean, a real course in logic. And I see your hands, please. All right, you see these 10 people with their hands up? These are the homeschoolers, all right? <laughs> We don't teach logic in public school. We ought to, but instead of teaching kids how to think, we're teaching them what to feel. 
And that's dangerous. Why? Because if you start living by your feelings all the time, you're going to go to a very dark place. Yes, yes, emotions make life fun, but logic makes life safe. And you've got to learn how to think properly because there's a lot of deceptive and false ideas out there. And what we're going to talk about here is something called the law of non-contradiction. It's a fundamental law of all logic. It says opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense. For example, we can't both be at Boise State and not at Boise State at the same time and in the same sense, right? It's one or the other. Jesus can't both have risen from the dead and not risen from the dead at the same time and in the same sense. One of those is true, the other's false. You with me? All right, now we're going to apply this law of non-contradiction to statements that are made in our culture, and they're everywhere. In fact, suppose you were to say to somebody, Christianity's true, and then this person said to you, there is no truth. You should ask that person a question, what should the question be? Yeah, if somebody says there's no truth, you're going to ask, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough. But because this is what is known as a self-defeating statement. It violates the law of non-contradiction. If this statement is true, it's false. Do you see the problem? And this is postmodernism. This is relativism. And it's logically incoherent. It would be like me saying I can't speak a word in English. If I were to say I can't speak a word in English, what would you say? Man, you're using English to say it. It would be like me saying my parents had no kids that lived. Or my brother is an only child, right? These are self-defeating statements, and you've got to get good at identifying them because they're everywhere. Now, and if, by the way, if you start living by them, you're going to smack up against reality, and it's going to hurt. In fact, here's the thinking skill you got to get good at using. What you want to do is you want to turn the claim on itself. Turn the claim on itself. So if someone says there's no truth, you turn the claim on itself and ask, is that true? true? All right. Now, you can amaze your friends with this. Why? Because you're not being unkind. You're asking questions. That's all you're doing. So let's do a few more. How about if somebody says there's no such thing as absolute truth? Yeah, is that an absolute truth? Can everyone see that this is an absolute truth claim? At the same time claiming there are no absolute truths? This defeats itself. You could also say, are you absolutely sure? Because this person is claiming that there are no absolute truth claims while making one. All right. Now, in our culture, it's not often said this way much anymore. It's more often said this way. There isn't the truth, only my truth. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth. You live your truth, I'll have my truth. We'll all get along. This sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds, it sounds like we all ought to believe this. It sounds so Oprah, doesn't it? Okay, there's just one problem with it, and that is it's logically self-defeating. Because if somebody says there isn't the truth, only my truth, and you turn the claim on itself, you simply ask, is that just your truth or the truth? Look, if the statement on top is just your truth, in other words, it's just your opinion, well, okay, why should I believe it? But if the statement on top is the truth, can everyone see that the first half of the statement says there aren't any the truths? Can everyone see this is a the truth claim, claiming there are no such thing as the truth claims? It's logically self-defeating. Now, I know it's very unpopular in our culture to say this, especially on a co college campus, but I gotta say it anyway. There's no such thing as your truth. There's no such thing as my truth. There's just the truth. If you want to say you have your own truth, you might as well say I have my own math. I mean, imagine if uh, Michael uh, asked me to hang around, Michael who organized this whole thing. He said, Frank, can you hang around tomorrow and help us around here around the campus? We need some work done. If you, if you hang out, uh, I'll pay you $10 an hour. You just tell me how many hours you work. By the end of the day, I'll pay you. Now, actually, Michael would never do this. He doesn't pay that much. Anyway, <laughs> but let's suppose I, 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 I worked on to dust tomorrow, 15 hours, I'm done. I say, Michael, I'm done. He says, what do I owe you? I said, okay, uh, let's see, $10 an hour times 15 hours, you owe me $150,000. And he goes, 150,000? No, I owe you 150, and I go, oh no, you don't understand. I have my own math. <laughs> He's gonna say, you're crazy. 
There's no such thing as my math or your math. There's just math. Now, parents, I'm not talking about the kind of math your kid brings home and you go, this isn't my math. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not talking about that, right? <laughs> Look, there's one answer to the problem, all right? It's not my opinion or your opinion. It's not my truth or your truth. There's just math and there's just truth. It's not mine or yours. Now, this might be the biggest one in our culture right now. You ought not judge, especially if you're a Christian. People say, you're a Christian? Jesus said, don't judge. Why are you judging, you hypocrites? All right, let's leave Jesus aside for just a second. Logically, what's the problem with the claim? Yeah, if someone says, you ought not judge, simply ask, hey, isn't that a judgment? <laughs> or you might want to say, if we're not to judge, then why are you judging me for judging? Now, you might say, well, didn't Jesus say don't judge? Nope, never said it. Sure he did, Frank. He said it right in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is in the middle of his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. All right. Whether you're a Christian or not, just stick with me for a minute. I know it's going to sound weird. But there are no verses in the Bible. There are no verses in the Bible. Do you think when Matthew was writing his biography of Jesus that we call a gospel, he said, here's chapter 7, verse 1. No. When were the chapter and verse divisions put in? About 500 years ago to help us navigate the text, which is really important. Why? It would be really hard to find your way around this big series of books that we put under one binding if you didn't have numbers. I mean, imagine if you're, you go to a church one day and the pastor's up there with this big Bible with no numbers and you didn't have numbers in your Bible and he just opened this big book and he looked out at you and he said, let's go about two-thirds of the way in, let's even find the same spot. Right? No, you couldn't do that, right? You need numbers to help you find your way around. The problem is we tend to think if it's got a number in front of it, we can take it out and make it say whatever we want. You can't do that. You've got to read around the passage to see what's going on. Now, actually, some of you are going to hate me for this, but I don't care. I'm leaving tomorrow. All right? <laughs> but this is why you Christians in here should never say that Jeremiah 29.11 is a promise to you. What's Jeremiah 29, 11? You know Jeremiah 29, 11. Oh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in a future. I mean, this is on pillows. This is on coffee mugs. This is on birthday cards. This is everywhere. Is this a promise to 21st century Christians living in Idaho? No. No. Who's that a promise to? Exiles. Yes, those are the pro that's a promise to the Jewish exiles who were taken forcibly by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian dictator, in 586 B.C. Out of Judah, he took them to modern-day Iraq, Babylon at the time, and through the prophet Jeremiah, God was saying, 70 years from now, I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to bring you back into the land. I have a future for you. I have a hope for you. And actually, 70 years later, in 516 B.C., they rebuilt the temple. But this is not a promise to us. When people say, oh, I'm claiming Jeremiah 29, 11 as a promise to me, I say to them, why don't you claim Jeremiah 44, 11 as if it's a promise to you? What's Jeremiah 44, 11? Jeremiah 44, 11 is the promise God made to the exiles that went to Egypt that year. And he said, don't go to Egypt. You know what Jeremiah 44, 11 says? It says, I will destroy you and all Judah. <laughs> you don't see that stitched into a pillow. You don't see that on a coffee mug. You don't see that on a birthday card, happy birthday. I will destroy you in all Judah. That is so sweet, Grandma. Thank you so much. No, we're taking stuff out of context. The Bible is not a fortune book. You don't just open it up and pull a verse out. And the same thing is true with Matthew 7, 1. Does Jesus just say, judge not, and he stops right there? What does he say? He says, judge not. Lest you be judged by the same standard you judge others, you be judged by that standard. So before you try and take the speck out of your brother's eye, you hypocrite, which is a judgment. You notice that? You hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be better able to help your brother. Then he goes on to talk about don't cast your pearls before swine, which is, involves a whole other series of judgments. Is Jesus telling us not to judge here? No, he's telling us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. He's simply saying get that problem out of your life first before you before you go try and help your brother. In other words, this is not a command not to judge. It's a command on how to judge. 
don't judge hypocritically. If you've got that problem, fix it, then go help your brother. But it would be completely ridiculous to say don't make judgments. Why? Number one, it's a judgment itself. Number two, you'd be dead already if you didn't make judgments. You made 100 judgments just coming over here tonight. Now you're going, this was a bad judgment. This guy's crazy. What am I doing here, right? <laughs> Everybody makes judgments. Atheists make judgments. They judge there's no God. They judge Jesus didn't rise from the dead. They judge there's no meaning or purpose to life. When you die, you just become worm food. It's pointless. There's no hope. Have a nice day. <laughs> These are all judgments. The question isn't whether or not you can make judgments. The question is, are your judgments true? That's why Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. I will say this, however, Jesus did save a very stern rebuke for people who were judgmental. And who were the judgmental ones in his day? Pharisees. Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? What did they do? What was their job? They were the religious and political leaders of Israel. Some of them are on the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish ruling council, the lawmaking body to whom Rome delegated day-to-day -day lawmaking authority. They were the politicians. And Jesus went after these people. Are you telling me Jesus got involved in politics? Yes! And he wasn't so nice doing it. In fact, if you think Jesus was a sweet guy who's never said a bad word about anyone, you have not read John chapter 2, John chapter 8, or Matthew chapter 23. What happens in John chapter 2? Jesus makes a whip, and he goes, and he jacks people up in the temple. Sweet and gentle Jesus did. Yes! And then he's having an argument with these politicians, these Pharisees in John chapter 8. He's right in the middle of the argument with them when he says, your father is the devil. Jesus, you can't say that. That's not very Christ-like. Excuse me, I am Christ. <laughs> you imagine you're having an argument with somebody and you stop right in the middle and you go, your father is the devil. Never try that with a sibling, by the way. And then in Matthew 23, Jesus really goes after these politicians. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, you look great on the outside. You're whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You go a mile to make a convert, and then once you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. How will you avoid being condemned to hell? What? sweet and gentle Jesus said this yes Jesus was not Barney <laughs> can't we all get along boys and girls no I came to bring a sword it's going to divide mother and daughter father and son how often have you heard those passages talked about but many of you know that those passages are true because some of you are divided in your own family over Jesus and guess what you ought to be Jesus did not come to bring unity, not with the world. Unity in the church, but not with the world. You're supposed to follow him. And some people don't want to follow. So Jesus was tough. In fact, why do you think they killed him? Do you think he was killed for saying, love your neighbor? Does that get anyone killed? Love your neighbor. You must die. No, that doesn't get you killed. What gets you killed? Claiming to be God, that gets you killed because that was blasphemy to the Jews and sedition to the Romans. He also annoyed Caiaphas, the high priest, who knew that if Jesus succeeded, he was out of a job. You don't need a temple if Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, where's the temple now? Yeah, look around. We're all temples if you're a believer. But Caiaphas knew if Jesus succeeded, he was out of a job. I think he knew Jesus was the Messiah because right after he raises Lazarus from the dead, Caiaphas says, it's better that one innocent man die than the whole nation perish. He didn't want to lose his job, so he had Jesus killed. He suppressed the truth because he wanted to do his own thing. And by the way, we suppress the truth, don't we? In fact, when you tell somebody something that's true and they get mad at you, you just help convict them. As Augustine said, we love the truth when it enlightens us. We hate the truth when it convicts us. A few military people in here, and by the way, I was in the Navy for eight years, which stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> for you military people in here, you always get more flack when you're over the target. If you tell somebody something that's true and they're shooting back at you, you're over the target. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. We suppress the truth because we want to go our own way. 
And by the way, there is nobody in this room, nobody watching out there, nobody outside this room who's going to get to God because we're any better than anyone else. We don't get to God because we perform better. We get to God because of what Jesus did for us. That's why evangelism is just one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. Now, we could talk a lot more about these self-defeating statements in our culture, but we don't have time. I just want to sum the whole section up this way. Can everybody see that this statement right here shoots itself? Can everybody see that? Which means relativism and postmodernism are false because they claim it's true that there is no truth. Tragically, many of our high schools and most of our universities have bought into postmodernism. Why would you go to a school and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to this school if the professor is just going to tell you the truth, that there is no truth? Does that make any sense? We go to a lot of colleges, as you know. Here's a uh, picture of an event we had at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And they love the Bible there about as much as the University of California at Berserkly does. <laughs> and... Um, We'll have the mic set up for Q&A later, and I normally ask people who are not Christians this question. So if you get up to the mic, I may ask you this question, and it's not fair of me to do that without me warning you about the question first, because I'm supposed to be the one taking the questions, okay? So I'm going to tell you the question I normally ask, so you can be ready for it. Here's the question. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, No! No. Wait, I thought you claimed to be a beacon of reason. How is it reasonable that you wouldn't believe something that was true? Because it has nothing to do with reason. It's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God over their own lives. They're not on a truth quest, they're on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. Here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of fun but selfish and sinful things, yet over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in this room over 40 knows what I'm talking about because many of us have tried it ourselves. Oh, I'm going to live my way. I'm going to do it my way all the time. No, you're not. Not very long. If you are, you're going to wind up divorced, addicted, broken, alone, and probably prematurely dead. You just can't live by your impulses all the time. You just can't live for yourself all the time. If you want contentment, you've got to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. So, for you Christians in here, always ask people, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, it's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. For you non-Christians in here, how do you respond to that question? You can ask me, if atheism were true, would I be an atheist? Yeah, I would. Why would I believe something that wasn't true? Are we willing to follow the truth wherever it leads? Well, let's see if it's true that God exists. We know that truth exists. Next question is, does God exist? And I mentioned there are three arguments we're going to look at for the existence of God. There are more than three, but these are the only three we have time to briefly look at. And by the way, we'll spend most of our time in this question. The first question is, or the first argument is the cosmological argument. It's from the beginning of the universe. Cosmological just comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means world or universe. And it says if the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The second argument is the argument from design, known as the teleological argument. Telos is a Greek word meaning design or purpose. And it says if there's design in the universe and design in you, life, then there must be a designer. Now, these two arguments have some scientific evidence behind them. We'll see some of that. Third argument doesn't have any science behind it, yet it's the argument we've all intuitively understood since we were very small children. It's the argument from morality known as the moral argument. And it says if there's one thing morally wrong out there, just one, like it's wrong to torture babies for fun, or it's wrong to murder six million people in a holocaust, or it's wrong to walk into a school and shoot nine-year-olds, then there has to be a God. Why? Because if there is no standard beyond humanity that we're all obligated to obey, everything's just a matter of opinion. That's just your opinion against Hitler's opinion. That's just your opinion against some school shooter's opinion. Well, we know these aren't just matters of opinion, so there must be a standard that we're obligated to obey. That standard is God's nature. We'll get to that later. We've got to start with the cosmological argument. 
Now, you got to admit, it was worth coming here tonight, even standing in the back, just to see God do that. Did you see that? Some of you have said, I've never seen God move. Oh, really? Check this out. Look at that. Now, this is the argument that many say points back to the big. Now, I know there's some Christians in here going, uh, Frank, you know, we're Christians in here, and uh, we don't believe in the Big Bang. You guys don't believe in the Big Bang? I believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. <laughs> in fact, the evidence for the Big Bang is so good that even atheistic scientists admit it. Stephen Hawking, who was probably the top physicist in the world until he died about six years ago. He was an atheist, but here's what he said. He said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, many of you know Hawking was sort of a medical miracle. He got ALS decades ago, and somehow he lived for like 40 or 50 years. But as an atheist, he still admitted this. He didn't have a good explanation other than God, but he's admitting the evidence. Now, we're not going to go through the evidence for this here tonight. Why? Number one, we don't have time. Number two, it's all in the book, chapter three. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And number three, it's not controversial. Everyone admits the universe had a beginning. What is controversial is what caused the universe to have a beginning. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want to look at one piece of philosophical evidence, or at least a philosophical argument, to show that I think beyond any doubt the universe had a beginning. You don't even need the science to know this. Take a look at this timeline for a minute. Uh, there's today, there's yesterday, there's the day before yesterday, last week. Let's say we don't know how far over here the timeline goes. We don't know when it starts or if it starts. Question, can this timeline be infinite into the past? Nope. No, why not? That's right. If there were an infinite number of days before today, you would never get to today. Why? Because you've always get, you'd always have to live another day before you got to today, if there's an infinite number of days before today. But since today is here, time must have had a beginning. Some of you are looking at me like Charlie Brown's teacher right now. It, I know this can give you intellectual constipation, but just think about it. If the past were infinite, today never would have arrived. But here we are, which means time had a beginning. And if time had a beginning, what could have caused time? Only something timeless. Now, if you're timeless, do you have a beginning? No. So you don't have a cause, which means the question who made God is a nonsense question because what we mean by God is the uncaused first cause, the timeless being that didn't have a beginning. So now let's take a look. If the universe had a beginning, then it must have had a beginner. We've got two options, either... No one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, here's my only question. Which view is more reasonable? That no one created something out of nothing, or someone created something out of nothing? Yeah, number two, right? I was at Texas A&M once, and the guys, some atheist said, oh, I think number one is more reasonable. I said, number one? <laughs> Let's look at number two for a second. Number two says, someone created something out of nothing. Now, that's a miracle, right? But at least you got a miracle worker. You got someone. Number one is a miracle with no miracle worker. That's clearly absurd. In fact, do you realize that everybody believes in at least one miracle? Christians believe in this miracle and several others. Atheists believe in a miracle. They believe that no one created something out of nothing. Lawrence Krauss, for example, who is an astrophysicist or physicist from Arizona State. He was at Arizona State. He was guys basically saying, oh, yeah, the universe came into existence out of nothing without a cause. He's just given up on the entire principle of science, that every effect has a cause. The universe is an effect. Now, think about this. If space, matter, and time had a beginning, and everyone seems to be admitting that, what could have caused that? Only something outside of space, matter, and time. In other words, the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful to create the universe out of nothing personal in order to choose to create. Why? Because to go from a state of nothingness to a state of creation, someone had to make a choice and only persons can make choices. The being would also have to be intelligent to have a mind to make a choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? God. You say, how do you know it's the Christian God, Frank? We don't yet. 
This could be Allah or some other theistic or deistic God. We don't have enough information yet. This could be the Christian God. We've got six attributes that show us it's consistent with the Christian God, but we got to go through the rest of those questions. And if we do and we realize that Jesus really did rise from the dead, then we can say that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,991 years ago last week is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. We haven't gotten there yet, but we have six attributes of the being that created the universe. Now, the second argument for God, oh, a question you should ask. If there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? I mean, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Why do I exist? Why do you exist? Why does the universe exist? Why do the Dallas Cowboys exist? I mean, you know, these are hard questions to answer if there's no God, right? Okay. This is a question posed by Leibniz, a philosopher who lived a couple hundred years ago. Why does anything exist if there is no uncaused first cause? Nothing would exist. Now, the second argument is the argument from design known as the teleological argument, and this has two aspects to it. And this argument has really come into favor in recent years. We'll spend a little bit more time on this one. The first aspect is the universe appears to be designed, and secondly, you, life, appears to be designed. Let's look at the universe first. Scientists have discovered in recent decades the universe is fine-tuned. That if you were to change any one of a number of factors virtually imperceptibly about our universe, either the universe itself wouldn't exist, or if it did, it couldn't certainly support life. And even atheists admit this. Stephen Hawking, again, put it this way. He said if the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back on itself or never developed galaxies. If the expansion rate was that infinitesimally different from the very beginning, none of us would be here. Now, you can't make any sort of evolutionary explanation for this. You can't say, well, maybe it evolved uh, to that rate by chance. Why? Because it started at the right point. It's the initial condition of the universe. It seems to me the same being that created space, time, and matter is the same being that fine-tuned the expansion rate to be precisely what it needed to be. Also, the gravitational force, if it were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power compared to the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't exist. What's one part in 10 to the 40th power? That's one part in one with 40 zeros following it. You say, Frank, I can't get my head around that number. I know, neither can I. Let me give you an illustration. Take the entire North American continent from Central America all the way to Greenland and stack it in dimes all the way to the moon. That's 238,000 miles. And do that on a billion other North American continents. Then take all those dimes, put them in one huge pile, mark one dime red, mix it in, blindfold a friend, throw them on the pile, ask him to pick one dime at random. The chance he would pick that one red dime is one chance in 10 to the 40th power. Is he going to pick that dime? No. Look, there's only two explanations for this value being where it is. It was either designed to be there or it wasn't. What makes more sense? Somebody designed it to be right there. And by the way, this is, these are just a couple of about a dozen of these. If you change any one of them, that imperceptibly, we don't exist. This is why even Christopher Hitchens years ago, who was an atheist I debated a couple times. You guys remember Christopher Hitchens? He was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. <laughs> That's why he said this is the hardest, the hardest to answer from an atheistic perspective. Why is everything so precisely balanced on a razor's edge? And it's not just the universe that is fine-tuned. Our solar system has about 100 attributes of it that if any one of them were changed, we couldn't exist. In fact, let's take a look at the solar system here for just a second. Here we are, a third rock from the sun. If we were just a little bit closer to or a little bit further away, we couldn't survive. A little bit closer to, we'd burn up. A little bit further away, we'd freeze. We are what scientists call the Goldilocks zone. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It is. It's a lie. It's way too cold here in the winter. Come on. The axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees, change that slightly, we don't exist. Earth rotation, 24 hours, change that slightly, we don't exist. The size and distance of the moon from us, change that slightly, we don't exist. By the way, the size and distance of the moon is just right so we can experience a solar eclipse. If it was any different, we couldn't experience that. Uh, if Jupiter was not in its current orbit, we couldn't exist here on Earth. Why, what does Jupiter do for us? 
Jupiter's gravitational force is so strong that it attracts most of the meteors and space junk to it. It's a cosmic vacuum cleaner. In fact, if you take a close-up look at Jupiter, you know what these dark marks are? Those are comet fragment strikes that are bigger than the Earth. Thank God for Jupiter. <laughs> because if Jupiter wasn't there, we wouldn't be here. Saturn does the same thing. In fact, you want to see the size of the planets? Here they are. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Earth. Look at poor Pluto down here. You know, Pluto recently has been demoted as a planet. I don't know about you, but I think it's size discrimination. <laughs> and what if Pluto identifies as a planet? <laughs> what then? You bigots. <laughs> Take a look at this. You can hardly see Pluto. Take a look at this. That's Arcturus, that's another star in our galaxy. Here's the sun. Jupiter is one pixel in size on this scale. Earth is invisible. Pluto, forget about it. <laughs> All right, keep an eye on Arcturus. Where's Arcturus now? See it over here? That's Antares, that's another star in our galaxy. The sun is one pixel in size on this scale. Jupiter is invisible. Earth, Pluto, forget about them. In fact, if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse here would be... Look, I don't name the stars, all right? If the Earth was the size of a golf ball, Betelgeuse would be five or six Empire State Buildings high. And that's just in our galaxy. This is not outside our galaxy, this is inside our galaxy. And the average distance between stars in our galaxy is 30 trillion miles, and all that distance is necessary for us to exist here on Earth. Now, 30 trillion miles, how far is that? Far. <laughs> It'll take you at least two tanks of gas on a Toyota Prius <laughs> to go 30 trillion miles. You remember when we had a space shuttle It would go around the Earth? It would go at about 18,000 miles an hour. That's five miles per second. You got trouble getting to school in the morning? Take the space shuttle. You'll be five miles a second. Think about how fast that is. Well, I did a little calculation to try and figure out how long would it take us if we could get in the space shuttle and go from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away, 30 trillion miles, if we could go five miles a second. In other words, how long would it take us to go five miles a second uh, how long would it take us to go 30 trillion miles if we could go five miles per second? How long do you think it would take us? At least a day. That's a good, yeah, good guess, yeah. <laughs> At least a day. Are you in the space program here? <laughs> okay, you should be. You should be in the space because I wish we could do it that fast. No, it would take us 201,450 years. That means if, at least a day, you're right. That means if you got in the space shuttle at the time of Christ and started traveling from our star, the sun, to another star an average distance away inside our galaxy, you've been going five miles a second for 2,000 years, you would be less than one hundredth of the way there right now. And we're going to explore space. No, we're not. We're not going anywhere in space. We can hardly get out of our solar system. It took us nine years to get to Pluto. The distances are just amazing. And notice what the psalmist says about all this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Well, how high are the heavens above the earth? I mean, if you've got 30 trillion miles just between stars in our galaxy, it'll take you over 200,000 years at five miles a second. How high is this whole show? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope helped us discover that. Back about 20 years ago, they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on 1 26 millionth of the sky. What's 1 26 millionth of the sky? Go outside tonight, put a piece of rice on the end of your finger, hold it up. That piece of rice represents about 1 26 millionth of the sky. So they trained Hubble on that spot for about 11 days of exposure time. I'm going to show you what they found. Uh, I don't know if you can see this along the bottom here. These are mountains, right? This is the southern hemisphere. They put together a composite video. 
I'm going to show you what they found. This is called Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's in the public domain. You can Google this and go find it. And there's no audio to this video. It's just video. And when I play it, you're going to see the constellations come up, and then Hubble's going to zoom out to that one little speck of sky. You guys ready? Here it is, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. are nearly 10,000 galaxies, each with billions of stars of their own. If you find 10,000 galaxies in one twenty-six millionth of the sky, how many stars are there in the entire universe? The number of stars in the entire universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth times 100,000. And to go from one grain of sand to another grain of sand going five miles a second will take you over 200,000 years. The heavens are awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to ever hear a Bronco again ever use the word awesome unless you're talking about God or the heavens. Awesome shot, dude. Awesome shirt, dude. Awesome TikTok video, dude. No! <laughs> what are you going to save for this? If this is meant to communicate to us, the infinite nature of the creator does a pretty good job, but it also puts us in a big trouble. Why? Because if this is meant to communicate infinity and every one of this creator's attributes are infinite, that means he's infinitely just, and that means we're all in trouble because we've all been unjust. So what's the solution? The psalmist tells us the solution. I only showed you the first half of the verse. Here's the second half. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. How has he done this? The only way an infinitely just creator can allow unjust creatures like you and me to go unpunished is if he finds an innocent substitute who takes our punishment upon himself. Where can he find an innocent substitute? Not in any one of us. So what does he do? He adds humanity to his deity. He comes to earth. He allows the creatures that rebelled against him to torture and kill him so he could be our substitute and take our punishment upon himself. And then by trusting in him, you're not only forgiven, you're given his righteousness. This is why Paul says in his letter to the Romans, Christ remains just and is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How does God remain just? He punishes sin, but he doesn't punish the sinner. He punishes someone innocent. This is why Jesus is the only way. It's not an arbitrary claim. There's no other way an infinitely just being can allow sinners like you and me to go unpunished unless he punishes an innocent substitute in our place. And he is the innocent substitute. This is why this is the greatest story ever told. And it happens to be true. Now, when you look, one other thing. There's only two things any of us are gonna get, are gonna get in the afterlife. You're either going to get justice or you're going to get grace. Who in here wants justice? I don't. You want grace? It's available. 
it's free. Now, when you look at a universe that has stars equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths, and it's going to take you over 200,000 years at five miles a second to go between those stars, does that make you feel insignificant? It shouldn't. Why? Because as amazing as the heavens are, they're not made in the image of God, but you are. In fact, the heavens were made for you. And here's the second aspect of the design argument. You're designed. In fact, this is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal, mineral, vegetable, or human? In fact, let's go back earlier than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. <laughs> when your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was the race. And you won. That's right. That's right. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. You beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limp in here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. <laughs> but you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt, yet it contained half of the 3.2 billion letter genome, your software program, your DNA, all the letters in the right order, that makes you you. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book, and it contained the other half of the 3.2 billion letter software program, your genome, your DNA, all the letters in the right order. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood, time, Air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. We don't kill the two-year-old. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? Genetically, it's the same. You say, wait a minute, Frank. You can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. <laughs> this was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. All laws declare one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, well, don't, don't impose your morality on me, I say, why not? Would that be immoral? <laughs> because you know what you're doing? You're imposing your morality on me right now. You're saying I ought not impose ought nots, but you're imposing that ought not on me. Why do you get to impose ought nots, but I don't? Actually, the better answer is this. When somebody says, don't impose your morality on me, I think you ought to say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder's wrong, that abortion's wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that child mutilation is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law, have the law written on their hearts. Look, if you don't like the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go back to this. <laughs> From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place inside of you. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. Or most of you, anyway. Um, <laughs> Some cells became brain cells, others heart cells, others lung cells. How did they know how to do this? Nobody knows. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. 
You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another. Knock it off. I mean, are you thinking about this? Are you going, oh, I got to concentrate, Frank. Wait, here, red blood cells coming up. No, this is just happening. How is it happening? Aristotle noticed something 2,400 years ago. Of course, he didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did notice that all of nature is going in a direction consistently. I mean, do you ever notice that an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? And by the way, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground thinking, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No. But if it's properly nourished, it goes in the direction of becoming an oak tree. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, and it doesn't, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That's what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD, and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God, that all of nature's going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be someone directing it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the Big Bang argument that we talked about earlier. This is not an historical cause. This is a right now, present day cause. Every single second the universe exists, someone is directing it. Did you ever ask yourself? Why are the natural laws so consistent and persistent? Why could we predict when that eclipse would occur and where it would occur and how it would occur? Because the universe is orderly. It's the product of a mind. This is why we can do science, ladies and gentlemen. People always say, oh, yeah, we, we don't need God. We got science. You can't do science unless God exists. Unless there's an orderer out there that orders everything and keeps everything going. That's how cause and effect works. This is why the Apostle Paul said, in, live, in him we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. In fact, God is to the universe what a band is to music. If a band were up here playing the music, the band would be creating and sustaining the music. What would happen to the music the second the band stopped playing? Music would be over. Same thing is true with God. God creates the universe and the natural laws that govern it, and he creates you, and he sustains the universe and the natural laws that govern it, and he sustains you. If you were to pull his hand away from this creation, we'd go out of existence. Now... There's a lot more on this in a book called Stealing from God, but we don't have time to unpack that. We've got to move to our third argument for God, and that is the moral argument. Now, probably the best way to communicate this argument is to talk football. <laughs> All right, here's the question. How do you know that your quarterback throwing a touchdown is better than your quarterback throwing a pick six? That's when he throws it to the other team, and they take it back for a touchdown. How do you know? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> Not just the rules. Why is it good? How, why is that good? You've got to have a goal. You've got to have a purpose. If there's no purpose, you can't say that the touchdown gets us closer to the purpose while the pick six takes us further away. Without purpose, there's no good plays. There's no bad plays. They're just different. In fact, in football, the purpose of the game comes from outside the game. When the Chiefs and the 49ers played a couple of months ago in the Super Bowl, when they got to the field, they didn't set the game up. They didn't set the rules up. They, the purpose wasn't set. They didn't set that up. Who set that up? Where, do the per where does the purpose and the rules come from? It comes from the commissioner and the competition committee, and every once in a while they tweak the rules. In fact, they just tweaked the rule last week. You know, the drop... The, the drop tackle, actually, it's now two-hand touch. You can't tackle anymore, all right? That's it. The rules have changed completely. Why? Yeah, yeah, they can do that. Why? Because the game of football is arbitrary. The rules could be different. The rules come from outside the game, but the rules could be different. Well, the rules of life and the purpose of life comes from outside the game too, but the rules couldn't be different, not the ones that are based on the nature of the creator. 
Do you realize that if there is no God, which means there is no purpose, then the Nazis were not wrong? Why? Because if there's no purpose to life, you can't say the Nazis were doing something wrong. If there is no purpose or there is no God, there are no human rights. I've noticed in our country, we seem to be creating rights every 10 minutes. Have you noticed this? We've got all these new rights, and many of the people claiming they have these new rights are atheists. There are no rights if there's no God. Everything's a matter of opinion. There's not only no trans rights, there's no Christian rights. There's not only no right to abortion, there's no right to life. There's not only no right to same-sex marriage, there's no right to natural, there's no right to anything if there's no God. Now, if there is a God, then you have to discover what is, what are the true rights. But without God, there are no rights at all. If there is no God, murder, slavery, and racism are not wrong. But we all know they are wrong. If that's the case, God must exist. If there is no God, Christians have never done anything wrong. Hey, Christians in here, what do people claim you do wrong? What's the biggest objection they have? You're a hypocrite. Right? Now, if someone ever calls you a hypocrite, if you're a Christian, you know what you ought to say? You're right. Yeah, I am a hypocrite. And you've just given evidence for God. Why? What's wrong with hypocrisy if there's no God? Why would that be wrong? Of course, we're all hypocrites. And a lot of people are, are resistant to Christianity because Christians are hypocrites who have treated them poorly. That doesn't mean Christianity is false. In fact, maybe here's a good way of looking at it. This is from John Dixon, who is a historian. He asks people who have been put off by the church or by Christians this question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? Yeah, you don't blame Beethoven, right? You blame the player. So when somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Jesus. Look, just because I'm not true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Just because I'm fallen doesn't mean Jesus is fallen. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We're all, by the way, everyone's a hypocrite. Atheists, they don't live up to their own standards either, do they? We're all fallen. That's why we need a Savior. And here's Christopher Hitchens, by the way, who wrote this book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And this is a picture from our second debate. You can see these debates on our YouTube channel. And much of what Hitchens says in that book is true, that Religious people have done evil things. But during the debate, I said to him, Christopher, you're right. A lot of what you say in that book is true. But you're proving our worldview. We believe that we've done evil things, and that's why we need a savior. And oh, by the way, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. I poison religion because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. But if I could, I wouldn't need a savior. In fact, I told Hitchens that during the debate, I said, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to live up to. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. If I, have I mentioned this yet? That you can get to heaven by being good? Yeah, you can. You just got to be perfect your whole life. Too late for me. How about you? That's why we need a savior. So I said to him, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to do. But if I did, I wouldn't need him. And when people say, I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, Come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> the church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. That's like saying I can't go to the gym because there's too many out of shape people down there. Well, that's why you're going to the gym, because you are out of shape. You're trying to get in shape. That doesn't make any sense. And by the way, if there is no God, tolerance is never good. That's, that's like the virtue in our country. Tolerance. Uh, by the way, are Christians commanded to be tolerant? Be careful how you answer. No, tolerance is too weak. Tolerance says hold your nose and put up with them. Love says reach out and help them. And that's what Christians are commanded to do. They're commanded to love. Now, tragically, we have a big misunderstanding in our culture. We think love means approval. Does love mean approval? Every parent knows love doesn't mean approval. In fact, how many parents do we have in here? All right, how many former children do we have in here? 
Okay, good. That's all of us, right? Now, if your, if your parents approved of everything you wanted to do when you were 13, would they have been loving? No, you need to stand in the way of evil if you're going to love somebody. Do you know in the passage that everybody reads at their wedding but nobody obeys? 1 Corinthians 13. Paul tells us what love is. He says love always protects, or what love does. Love always protects. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth. Love always perseveres. Love doesn't just say, oh, whatever you want to do is fine, honey. That's not love. That's enablement. Thomas Sowell, who's 93 years old and says everything right, said this. When you want to help people, you tell, them what, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Why do we tell people what they want to hear? So they don't get mad at us. Who are we helping then? We're not helping them. We're helping ourselves, aren't we? If you love somebody, you will tell them the truth. And one way you can do that is say, hey, honey, if I was about to go down a wrong road that would hurt me and others and would be against what God wants, would you love me enough to tell me? Well, of course. Great. Can I do that for you right now? Finally, if there is no God, you can't complain about injustice or evil. Why? Because there's no such thing as injustice or evil if there's no God. Not because God is doing evil or injustice, but because he's the standard by which we'd even know what those, those things were. In fact, C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian, he was in World War I, a terrible war. He actually lost his best friend in the war, and he promised to take care of his mother if the guy died, and Lewis did till the day she died. But he came out of World War I saying there can't be a good God, there's too much injustice in the world. And then one day he had an epiphany. It was after talking to Tolkien, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings. C.S. Lewis and Tolkien were buddies. And he ultimately wrote it in mere Christianity. Here's what Lewis wrote. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? You see, you wouldn't know what a crooked line was unless you knew what a straight line was. You wouldn't know that something was unjust unless you knew that something was just. Something can't be immoral unless something is moral. In fact, evil does not exist on its own. Evil exists only as a lack in a good thing. Evil is like cancer. If you take all the cancer out of a good body, you got a better body. What happens if you take all the body out of the cancer? You got nothing, it doesn't exist. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of a car, you got a better car. What happens if you take all the car out of the rust? You got a Pinto. Okay? It doesn't exist. I mean, you can look at it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you got to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil. But you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. So if evil exists, and we all know it does, the Dallas Cowboys do exist. <laughs> Cry me a river, cowboy fans. All right. If evil exists, that means that God exists. And if God exists, then evil doesn't disprove God. In fact, evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God. We all know evil exists, so if evil exists, that means God exists. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Now, you can ask, why would God allow certain evils? We'll save that for the Q&A if you want to talk about that, but you can't say it disproves God. Now, let's sum all this up. What can we learn from the cosmological argument about the first cause? The first cause is spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. From the design argument, we get more information that he's intelligent, and we also see that this being is sustaining the universe. And then from the moral argument, we can see that this being is morally perfect. So from these three arguments, we can say that there is a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, moral, intelligent first cause that created and sustains all things. This is the God of biblical Christianity, and we haven't even opened the Bible yet. This is called natural theology. 
You don't need to open the Bible to know this. Paul even writes this in, in, in Romans 1. He says, God's invisible qualities are clearly seen so that men are without excuse. In fact, if someone were to ever ask you, how do you know that God exists? Here's what I think you ought to say. I know God exists by his effects. If there's a creation, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a creator. If there's design in the universe and design in life, that's the effect. I'm reasoning back to a cause, a designer. If there's a moral law written on the heart, that's the effect. Then I'm reasoning back to a moral lawgiver. If there's evidence that a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. Who could have caused a man to predict and accomplish his own resurrection from the dead? Only somebody like God. You're always reasoning from effect to cause, and you're doing the same thing even if you think you've had some sort of personal experience with God. Maybe it's an answered prayer or something like that. You're doing the same thing. You're saying the answered prayer is the effect, and you're reasoning back to the source or the cause of that being God. You're reasoning from effect to cause. That's what scientists do. And the queen of all sciences is theology because it puts all truth in every category, every academic discipline under one umbrella and says, here's how it all integrates. Here's how it all fits together. So you're reasoning from effect to cause. And if you think that there is no ultimate cause, you're not being scientific. You're saying an effect can happen without a cause. So we know that truth exists, that God exists, but how do we know which God is the true God? That's what the third question will help us. And you're going, Frank, we're running out of time here. How do we get through this? This one's fast. Are miracles possible? Well, obviously, if God exists, they are, but a lot of people don't think they are. In fact, some people think miracles are impossible, like Noah. Hey, Christians, can we agree on one thing in here? If you're a Christian in here, can we just agree on this between ourselves? Noah and the ark is crazy. Yes, sir. Yep, thank you. And resurrections. I already asked you how many have seen a resurrection. Nobody raised their hands. And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a whale of a tail or a tail of a whale? I mean, what is the deal with Jonah? Can you really believe in Jonah? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? No, it's not the resurrection. The resurrection is easy compared to the greatest miracle in the Bible. The greatest miracle in the Bible is... I got some of you a second time. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible. Now, here's the interesting thing. Even the atheists are admitting the evidence for the first verse. They don't think it's God, but what else could it be? It's got to be a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent creator. And so if Genesis 1-1 is true... Are these other verses possible? Of course Noah's crazy, unless God exists. Of course resurrections don't happen, unless God exists. Of course Jonah's a fairy tale, unless God exists. Now, do you realize that no miracles could have occurred since the New Testament and Christianity would still be true? You don't need modern-day miracles to show that Christianity is true. I think there are modern-day miracles, but you don't need them. In fact, you know, for atheism to be true, every single miracle claim and spiritual experience in the history of the world has to be false. Is that possible? No, it's possible. Is it reasonable to believe? No, I don't think so. And by the way, if miracles do occur, you shouldn't expect many of them to occur. Why not? Because miracles, by definition, have to be rare events. They can't be regular events. If they occur all the time, they don't get our attention. And God uses miracles to say, you who listen to this guy. In fact, if you look in the Bible, mi miracles are clustered around three time periods. Characters, Moses, Elijah and Elijah and Jesus and the apostles. Why? Because they have new revelation that needs new confirmation. There's a new sermon that needs a new sign. 
That's what miracles are used for most of the time in the Bible to confirm you ought to listen to this guy. But if these things happened all the time, they wouldn't get our attention as special acts from God. We'd say this stuff happens all the time. I mean, imagine if resurrections occurred routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean? Nothing. You go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle George just rose from the dead two weeks ago. <laughs> now I got to give the inheritance back. Yeah. No. If it happened all the time, you'd go, hey, this stuff had got to be a rare event to get our attention. And by the way, there, there are some spectacular things that happen every day. We don't consider them miraculous because they do happen every day, but sometimes we forget how amazing they are. In fact, let me ask you guys, how many people in this room have seen your own flesh and blood born? Every mother should raise your hand. Fathers. Now, when you see your own flesh and blood come out of either you or another human being, you don't go, evolution, right? <laughs> you go, this is amazing. We made Whoopi nine months ago, and now look at this. How did this happen? We don't call it a miracle, but we know there's intelligence behind it. How does this happen? It's amazing. Just, in fact, there was a, a biologist who once said this. We have him in the book. Uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. He said, God never did a miracle to convince an atheist because his ordinary works provide sufficient evidence. Look at an eclipse. Just look at the sun. Just look at the person sitting next to you. As C.S. Lewis said, if you saw that person on the other side, you'd be really tempted to worship that person. So, we know the truth exists, that God exists, that miracles are possible. Certainly, if God exists, they're possible. Now the question is, is the New Testament telling us the truth about the central miracle in the New Testament, and that is the resurrection of Jesus? Now, when we're looking at the New Testament, we're not assuming that the New Testament's the word of God or that it's inspired. We're just looking at it just like historical or historians look at any ancient document to see if there are signs they're telling the truth. And in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, we have the top 10 reasons we know the New Testament writers told the truth. We don't have time for 10 tonight. I want to just look at two reasons why I think the New Testament writers are telling the truth. These are tests that historians will make on the text to see if they're telling the truth. One of them is called embarrassing stories. It goes like this. If there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why would it be true? Because you're not going to invent stories that embarrass you. You might invent stories that make you look good, but you won't invent stories that make you look bad, right? In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look good? If you don't have your hand up right now, you're lying <laughs> to make yourself look good. <laughs> and it's not working. We know you're lying. All right, how many people in here have ever lied to make yourself look bad? You don't do that. You might lie to make yourself look good, but you won't lie to embarrass yourself. Well, the New Testament writers, it's true of the Old Testament as well, but let's just look at the New Testament. The New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories and details they never would have invented. That's why we call this the duh factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of them. Peter's called Satan by Jesus. He's the leader. Does that sound good? Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. What does he wind up doing? He denies him three times that at the crucifixion, all the disciples, maybe with the exception of one, they all run away for fear of the Jews. This is like a Monty Python movie. Run away. <laughs> and who are the brave ones? The women. The women are the brave ones. That's right, ladies. You can give yourselves a hand. That's right. <laughs> Didn't run away like you sissy pants men did. <laughs> now, who wrote the New Testament documents down? Men. Now, what man is going to invent that he was hiding for fear of the Jews? Why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb? Would any man in here invent that? I mean, if I was inventing it, I'd make myself look good, wouldn't you? 
I mean, I'd write down something like this. Let's see. Uh, we marched right down there, and we overpowered that elite Roman guard. Yeah, that sounds good. John said, get out. <laughs> Peter roundhouse kicked him. Thomas said, we'll be back. No doubt. <laughs> Some of you will get that tomorrow. And then we marched right down there on Sunday morning, and we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. I would never say it was Mr. Sissy Pants why the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. And oh, by the way, why would you never say the women were the first witnesses in that culture? Because a woman's testimony was not considered on par with that of a man. So if you're making up the New Testament story, you'd only have the men be the first witnesses. Yet all four Gospels say the women were the first witnesses. Which is telling us what? They really were. It's embarrassing, but they're telling it anyway. And it doesn't help their case. I actually had a woman come up to me once and she said, Frank, I know why Jesus appeared to the women first. I said, why? And she said, because he wanted to get the story out. I said, that is an excellent point. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that before. Because ladies, when your man comes home from work, does he say much? Psh, there could have been a nuclear explosion down at the plant. He's not going to tell you. You'll see it on the news before you hear it from him. You'll be watching the news going, hey, hon, what happened? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. <sighs> the nuke blew up. I've been hot for three days. <laughs> What's for dinner? He's not going to tell you. I was just at the University of, of Cincinnati in November, and one guy after this thing came up to me, and he said, you think that's bad? I had a friend that was on a private airplane, just he and the pilot, and the pilot died, and he didn't know how to fly the plane. So they talked him down from the tower, just like in the movies, and then he went home, and his wife saw him and said, honey, how's your day? How'd your day go? He went, same old, same old. <laughs> I can't even believe this next verse is in the New Testament, but it is. Do you remember when Jesus takes his disciples up on the hill in Galilee to give them the Great Commission? Where he says, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Notice he doesn't say make believers. He says make disciples. There's a difference. Anyway, as he's giving them the Great Commission, his disciples, verse 17, this is Matthew 28, 17 says of the disciples watching him give them the Great Commission, it says, some believed, but some doubted. What? He's standing resurrected right in front of them. And it's like they're going, you see that guy over there? Yeah. That guy over there is Jesus. No, it can't be Jesus. He was just killed not long ago. No, I'm telling you, it's Jesus. He's dead. It's him. Do you know what the Romans did to him? They whipped him. They put spikes through him. They, they cut his heart out, basically. And then, if they hadn't killed him by then, they would have been killed themselves because they couldn't let a criminal not get punished with death. So I'm telling you, Jesus is dead. It's him. It can't be. It is. How do you know? <laughs> the women told me. They're not making this up. There's even potentially embarrassing details about Jesus in the text. Jesus is considered out of his mind by his own family who wants to seize him and take him home. This is in Mark chapter 3. His family thinks he's nuts. Jesus' own brothers don't believe in him. They don't think he's God when he's walking the earth. Now, how many people in here have a brother? All right, how many people have a brother who thinks he's God? Yeah, you don't believe in him either, do you? Neither did Jesus' brothers. We know later, however, that James dies as a martyr. 30 years after the alleged resurrection because Jesus appeared to him resurrected. Jesus is called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. You think they invented that? He has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute, which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance. And oh, by the way, there are two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline. The Messiah's bloodline. Who are they? Rahab and Tamar. 
Now, do you think Matthew, who wrote this genealogy down, said, you know what, I really think I need to spice up the Messiah's bloodline a little bit. Let me put a couple of prostitutes in here. What do you say, Rahab? No. In fact, there's a lot of shady people in the bloodline. Judah, from where we get the term Jew from? Jesus, from the tribe of Judah. Not a good guy. He's the guy that sold his brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt, and then he slept with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who was playing a prostitute. David, David, a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but he's a liar, adulterer, and a murderer. Gee, I guess there's hope for the rest of us then, huh? <laughs> Bathsheba's in there. In fact, when Matthew gets to her in the genealogy, he doesn't mention her name. What does he say instead? Does anyone know? Yeah, he says, Uriah's wife. Who's Uriah? Husband of Bathsheba, whom David had murdered so he could have Bathsheba. He's telling the truth, but it's a slam. You notice this? The Bible's the ultimate no-spin zone. They don't spin any of this. They tell you the truth, warts and all. You would never find this in Egyptian history. If an Egyptian historian started to tell bad stuff about the pharaohs, off with his head. But both the New and Old Testaments tell you all the warts and all because they're telling the truth. Oh, and then they hang Jesus on a tree. If you're making up a Messiah to the Jews, you don't hang him on a tree. Why? Because, yes, Jesus would be under God's curse according to Deuteronomy 21, 23. Well, he was under God's curse. What curse? The curse of sin we put him under. But if you were making this up, you wouldn't say this. In fact, who, what are the two trees in Genesis? Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Go all the way to the book of Revelation. The, book, the Bible is very symmetrical. What tree do you find here? Tree of life. Do you know there's a tree in the middle? It's the tree upon which they hung Jesus. Because we sinned at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The only way we again have access to the tree of life is if Jesus is hung on a tree to take our punishment upon himself. But if you were making this up, you would never say that. Now, there's more in the book on embarrassing. We've got one more argument to give, and that is excruciating deaths. And this is the argument that says that these men who were in a position to know whether Jesus had resurrected or not died excruciating deaths when they could have saved themselves by saying, look, it never happened. In fact, do I have a brain tumor or did the lights just go out? <laughs> did someone lean on a, faucet, on a, a switch back there? I got to move more? As if I don't. Well, look at that. Clint is magic. Look at that. That's all right. We're almost done. There you go. Clint Boland, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. What we need to remember is that the writers of the New Testament, all of them, with the exception of Luke, he's the only Gentile, all of them are Old Testament believers in Yahweh. They already think they're God's chosen people. Two things they didn't think could happen a man could claim to be God that was blasphemy and secondly that someone would rise from the dead in the middle of time they knew everyone would rise from the dead at the end of time but they didn't think one guy would rise from the dead in the middle of time and yet that is exactly what they said now why would they say this what did the New Testament writers have to gain by making up a new religion what did they have to gain nothing they got kicked out of the synagogue, and then they got beaten, tortured, and killed. Last time I checked, that was not a list of perks. <laughs> hey, we're going to start a new religion. We are? Yeah. What's it going to get us? First, we get kicked out of the synagogue, then we get beaten, tortured, and killed. Well, sign me up. <laughs> what a great idea. Why haven't we thought of this earlier? No, I don't think so. In fact, they had every motive to say the resurrection did not happen, not every motive to say it did. You know, maybe you get the question, I get the question sometimes, are there any non-Christian writers to talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, they're all in chapter 9 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. They're not eyewitnesses, but they give basically the same storyline about how the disciples believed he rose from the dead and were willing to die for their beliefs. But you know what's kind of underneath that, that uh, question? An illicit assumption. What's the illicit assumption? That you really can't trust these writers because, you see, these people were biased. They were Christians. You can only trust the non-Christian sources to know what happened. If you think about that for more than five seconds, you'll realize how stupid that is. <laughs> what did these people have to gain by saying it was true? Nothing. They lost everything. 
They had no motive to invent this. They had every motive to say it didn't happen. Now, some of you may know my friend, Jay Warner Wallace, the cold case homicide detective, who's been on Dateline more than any other homicide detective because he solves murders decades old. Jim is also a Christian, and he took his uh, detective skills to investigate the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. And that's why he has a book called Cold Case Christianity. His website is coldcasechristianity.com. You ought to check it out. Anyway, Jim says that whenever he finds a body that he knows has been murdered, he says there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. I don't have to hunt down a thousand motivations as to why that guy was murdered. I just have to look at one of three or a combination of these three reasons. That guy was murdered because there was a sex issue a money issue, and or a power issue. Sex, money, or power. Those are the same three things that can co motivate people to murder. In fact, they're the same three things that can motivate any of us to sin. Why? Because sex, money, and power are good things. In fact, they're so good, we'll often take shortcuts to get them. So Jim says, if you're going to say the New Testament writers invented all this, You've got to find one or more of those three motivators as to why they would have done it. So let's take a look. Ladies and gentlemen, did the writers of the New Testament suddenly get real popular with the ladies for saying Jesus had resurrected from the dead? No, they didn't get sex. Did they get money? No, they weren't 21st century prosperity gospel preachers. Did they get power? No, they got the opposite of power. They were persecuted. Paul had power when he was persecuting the church. As soon as he becomes a Christian, he's the one persecuted. They didn't get sex. They didn't get money. They didn't get power. There's no motive to make this up. They're telling the truth. Now, last thing I want to say about this is going to sound like heresy. For those of you like me who believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, but it's not, stick with me. Well, before I do that, let me say one other thing. In addition to them having no motive to do this, they then went and died for it. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, Frank. If you're going to say martyrdom proves Christianity, don't you have to say martyrdom proves Islam? Because there are some Muslims that will die for their faith. And the answer is no. Why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. The Muslim martyrs of today haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. In fact, Muhammad himself said he didn't do miracles. He's just a plain warner. He was just warning people there's one God. The New Testament writers, on the other hand, or the New Testament martyrs, witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. Yes, some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. And the New Testament writers were in a position to know whether it was a lie or not, but they went to their deaths anyway. You can't get better evidence than that unless you were there yourself. All right, here's the last thing I want to say. It's going to sound like heresy, but it's not. Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. You say, how can that be? Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Why? Because they witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They didn't read about it in a book. Christianity did not begin with a book. Christianity began with an event, the resurrection. There would be no books written by Jews in the first century claiming a man claimed to be God and rose from the dead unless a man really did claim to be God and really did rise from the dead. In fact, we could put it this way. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. You wouldn't have these documents written down in the first century by these people unless the resurrection had occurred. Now, the whole argument is in the book. In fact, it goes into a lot more detail than this. But if truth exists, God exists, miracles are possible, and the New Testament's telling the truth about the resurrection, 
it's just like a bunch of dominoes after that that show you that the Bible is the word of God. If you want to go further, we don't have the books here. We sold out of them yesterday. But take your phone and take a picture of that QR code right there because I'm going to send you this entire PowerPoint presentation for free. I probably showed you tonight about 70 or 80 slides. The whole presentation has 362. Okay, and I'm going to send you a bunch of other presentations for free, too. We all have books and DVDs you can get on our website. That's the one we've been talking about today. There's also Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. There's other books that we have, DVD sets, so you can check that out. We're now teaching online courses. In fact, uh, this week we're starting a course called Jesus Versus the Culture. I'll be your instructor if you want to take that, especially during a political year. It's going to be an interesting course. Uh, we're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. <laughs> Have you guys signed up for You Twit Face yet? <laughs> we're on Instagram and TikTok as well. Uh, don't forget about the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast, two podcasts a week. We're on TV here at B7 p.m. in Boise. And if you don't do anything else, download the cross exam app. Two words in the App Store, cross examine It's got the TV show streaming, the podcast on it. It even has a quick answer section. So you might be having lunch with somebody, and they say something that you don't know how to answer. All you need to do is say, hey, hang on. I'm getting a text. <laughs> hey, what about this? Right there on your phone. All right. All right. So it's true. So what? So what if Christianity is true? Well, the greatest news of all, someone actually did die for you. Now, when I was in the Navy, I was in Navy, naval aviation, and we had to earn golden wings, and they were fairly hard to earn, but there's nothing more difficult in the military to earn than a golden trident. Very few people that start SEAL training make it through, maybe 5%. Those that do make it through wear that trident with pride. It is their identity. When Michael Monsor was buried in Rosecrans Cemetery in San Diego, California, just about every Navy SEAL on the West Coast showed up for his funeral. And when they passed his casket, they took off their tridents and they pressed them into his casket. They took their identity and put their identity in the one that died for them, the one that sacrificed for them. That's what we're supposed to do. But, you know, our culture says, oh, no, put your identity in your political party or put your identity in your ethnic group or put your identity in your sexual preference or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your job. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that those are all very fragile identities? For example, if you put your identity in your sexual preference, what happens when you can no longer sexually perform? You no longer have an identity, or you're no longer sexually preferred. You no longer have an identity. You put your identity in another person. What happens if, God forbid, that person dies or leaves you? You no longer have an identity. You put your identity in your job. What happens when you lose your job? You no longer have an identity? No. You were not meant to put your identity in those things. You were meant to put your identity in your Savior, the one that died for you. I mean, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone you love will die. Everything you build will crumble. Everything you say will be forgotten. Everything you do will come to nothing. You and your identity will die and vanish unless God exists. If God doesn't exist, Everything you see up there will happen. What about your identity then? Do you know that every other worldview says you have to achieve your identity? You've got to work for it. If you've got to achieve your identity, all the pressure's on you, and there's always somebody that can do it better. And you're going to look up at people that do it better, and you're going to envy them. And you're going to look down on people that can't do it as good as you, and you're going to provoke them. That's no way to live. In Christianity, you don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. You simply accept what he's already done on the cross and then promise to give you when he raises you from the dead. It's a secure identity. It's eternal. You can't lose it. 
In fact, I have a friend, she's a saint, she's 70 years old. She works at Starbucks, not for the money, but for the ministry. And some of the younger people who are trying to transition in Starbucks sit in the back door in their break, flipping through Reddit and TikTok, trying to get constant affirmation for what they're doing because deep in their hearts they know it's not working. So they need constant affirmation. And my friend says to them, you know, I graduated high school more than 50 years ago and I'm still paying for some of the bad decisions I made then. But what you're doing is irreversible. You're sterilizing yourself. You might not want a baby now, but what about in five years? This is not the way forward. And then after hours, she has Bible studies with them. Because she knows you don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity and you have it forever. If you've never received the identity that God provides for you, why not now? It's free. All right, what we're going to do now in a minute is go to questions. But before we do, Michael, I want people to know that there are places they can go to learn more about this kind of thing here on campus. So, Michael, can you tell them about Ratio Christi and about the other campus student groups and where people can learn more? Here he is, ladies and gentlemen. get connected. The wonderful director over there, Bill Publes. Uh, Publes? Publes? Uh, I, I always mispronounce his name. I'm so sorry, Bill, as you're watching this live stream. Uh, <laughs> uh, he helped us with our overflow tonight and moved everyone over to the Biblical Study Center. Thank you so much, Bill, as you watch this. And please don't kill me for mispronouncing your name. But I just want to thank everybody for turning out tonight uh, and coming here, and as well as the people who... Uh, were gracious enough to move over to the Biblical Study Center. Um, yeah. where, where is that study center? Oh, ah, uh, yes. The Biblical Study Center is off of uh, uh, University Drive and uh, oh crap, <laughs> Belmont. There we go, Belmont, Belmont, and University Drive, and it's right out in the corner there, um, a block up from there, and there's. A uh, parking lot and a giant biblical study sign, uh, flashing verses and events going on. Anyway, I just want to thank Frank Turek and his team for coming out here and making it happen, and Boise State for hosting us. I now turn it over for questions. Test, test, test. Question. All right. Second question. Just uh, line up behind that microphone, if you will. Once the first person starts, we'll have plenty of questions. So who's going first? All right. We've got someone coming right now. We've got two people coming right now. I'll try not to touch it. Yeah, try not to touch the mic, if you would. Go ahead. It's delicate. Okay. Go ahead, sir. What's your name? Uh, I'm Jonah. You talked about me today, actually, a little bit. Yeah. Hey, Jonah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually have a coworker 
who is a flat earther. So how do I, how do I address that? <laughs> I don't know why more and more people are saying this, but I'm pretty calm, but I want to punch somebody right now. <laughs> Here's what you do, Jonah. You say, take a long walk. And keep walking. <laughs> and you're going to wind up in the place you started. Okay? It's obvious. And what people are doing is they're taking figures of speech from the Bible and trying to say that they're literal when they're not literal. I mean, the Bible says the sun rises and the sun sets, but it's not literally rising and setting. It's the earth that's turning. It just looks like it's rising and setting. And by the way, that's the way we speak. Even today in our advanced scientific age, we still talk about sunrise and sunset. You know, you watch the news tonight, and the guy's going to say, you know, sunrise tomorrow at 641. He's not going to say earth rotation will become apparent <laughs> at 641, right? <laughs> So the Bible uses language like we use language. It doesn't mean every single expression is literal. And so that's what I would say to them. All right? Thanks. All right, thanks, Jonah. Yeah. Can you imagine if God had Jonah vomited out on a landmass to tell him the earth was flat? <laughs> it's crazy. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, Frank. My name is James. I have a couple questions yes, for you. If, if you could... Uh, can get through both of them. Sure, go ahead. It'd be great. If death entered the world through one man and it was all encompassing and eternal life entered the world through one man, Jesus, mm -hmm. then why would it be exclusive? What do you mean exclusive? Um, I believe what's meant by exclusive is uh, why is it only available to, I guess, people who accept it? Because God's not going to force anybody into heaven against their will. In fact, maybe a, a little story will help with this. Uh, a number of years ago, I was at the University of Michigan debating an atheist by the name of Eddie Tabash. And during the debate, he asked me a question. He said, Frank, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. She lived a life full of pain and suffering. Toward the end of her life, uh, someone offered her the gospel, but then she died. Is she in hell right now? So I said, Eddie, I don't know where your mother is now. I don't know if she had a deathbed conversion or not, but if she didn't accept Christ before she died, then Christ or God is too loving to force her into heaven against her will. Because what's the assumption behind the question? The assumption behind the question is that everybody wants to be in heaven. That's not true. Who's in heaven? Jesus is in heaven. There have people, been people running from Jesus their entire lives. What's he going to do in the afterlife? Hey, where are you going? You're with me now. No. You say, well, what's all this business about hell then? Well, I asked a question of the University of Michigan audience. I'll ask the question here of the Boise State audience. It's a question for the ladies. Ladies, have you ever had a young man pursue you whom you did not want to date? Some of you going, yeah, and he's sitting next to me right now. <laughs> he will not leave me alone. Whenever I ask that question, the ladies always giggle and the men look at their shoes. <laughs> she looking at me right now? Well, ladies, suppose uh, he keeps asking you out, he keeps asking you out, and you finally say, look, I like you, but only as a friend. Oh, ladies, why don't you just stick, stick the knife in and turn it? Every man has heard the dreaded friend rejection. Gentlemen, if you ever get the dreaded friend rejection, move on, she's not interested. In fact, I have some shocking news for you. She doesn't even like you as a friend. <laughs> Ladies, am I right? Yeah? You're just trying to be nice, aren't you? But you don't like him as a friend, because if you did, you'd be interested, but you're not. But suppose this doesn't deter the guy. He keeps asking, he keeps asking, and he finally says, look, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. Can he do that? No, run, screaming from the building. He can't force you to do that. If he truly did love you, what would he do? He would leave you alone. That's what God does for us. He sends us cards, letters, and flowers. He sends us creation. He sends us conscience. He sends us Christ. He sends us the Bible. If you're in a, a, if you're in a far off land as a Muslim, 
and you want to know the truth, God may give you a dream or a vision. That's all over the Muslim lands now. But if you keep saying no, 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 no to that, God is going to give you up to your own desires. He's going to leave you alone because that's what God does, just like that man pursuing you. If he were to love you, he would leave you alone because you don't want him. So that's what God ultimately does. He leaves us alone. And Paul says this in Romans chapter 1. He says, if you suppress the truth long enough about God, God will give you up to your own desires to the point that you have a futile mind and you're cheering on other people who are doing evil. Notice our culture right now. They're cheering on people who are doing evil. You say, well, what could be so bad about being separated from God? Because that's what hell is. Well, I want you to... I want you to realize that everybody, whether they're a Christian or not, gets some of the common grace of God. His reign falls on the just and the unjust. We all experience love, hope, hope for a future, relationships, whether we're Christians or not. But I want you to imagine a place where there is no love, where there is no hope, where there is no future, where there are no relationships, where there's just stone, cold, narcissistic self-absorption. That is Washington. <laughs> no, that is hell. You're cut off from the ultimate source of goodness by your own choice. And so as C.S. Lewis put it, in the end, there's only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. God is going to separate himself. It is open to everybody, but not everybody wants it. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Thank you. Can I ask one more? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. That's it. Goodbye. No. <laughs> no, go ahead. So, so if God expects man to forgive in all circumstances, like Jesus on the cross and Stephen when he was stoned, then why can't God just forgive all sinners? And how is it that God can live under a different standard for forgiveness? No matter what happens, when God says forgive, somebody is still paying the price of the sin. Like, for example, if you give me your car and I go out and crack it up and you say, I forgive you, you still have to pay for the car. Or I have to pay. Someone has to pay for the car, right? So there's always a payment regardless of whether or not the person forgives. Either you're going to pay or I'm going to pay. When it comes to Christianity, God pays. He pays for us. So no matter what happens, there's always a payment. Somebody's making a payment. And um, with regard to God, since he's infinitely just, he has to punish sin. Otherwise, he wouldn't be infinitely just. He can't, he can't violate his nature. So who does he punish in our place? Since he doesn't want to punish us, he punishes an innocent substitute. That's why I said earlier, there's only two things you can get in the afterlife. You can get justice or you can get grace. Nobody should want justice. We should all want grace. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Hey, uh, my name's Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Hey, uh, so my question stems on original sin and uh -huh. science, really. Okay. So as far as I understand it, original sin is really important to Christian doctrine because it's what introduces sin into the world through man. Man makes that mistake, and then they can't make up for us. So then Jesus dies on the cross to save us. Um, my question is, uh, I've, uh, I took a class in, in college that was science. That was your first mistake. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, but the class is called Science and Christian Faith. Mm -hmm. And so we, we talked about different scientific issues and how they kind of can pose challenges to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And the one challenge that I didn't really understand how to, how to rectify, how to understand, was the idea of, of original sin and um, science showing how... Uh, one, one example was genome sequencing, basically showing that like the population couldn't have been lower than around 10,000 people. And so if that kind of disproves Adam and Eve, the, the story of Adam and Eve, and it shows that that was more of a metaphorical story, how do you reconcile original sin and the, and the importance of that when you have science showing that that story couldn't have actually well, first happened? First of all, those genome studies uh, seem to come up with different results almost every five years, it seems. And Dr. William Lane Craig has just done some research on that. 
Uh, he's a Christian philosopher and apologist and wrote a book called The Historical Adam. I haven't read the book yet, but I think he addresses that issue in that book. So you may want to check that out. Okay. Uh, I think he can trace it back to just a couple. And so it depends on which scientist you're talking about. What we need to remember is that science doesn't say anything. Scientists say things. And are they interpreting the data right? Because if you notice, scientific theories change all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, because new information comes in, and sometimes they don't have the right information, or sometimes they interpreted the information they had improperly. <laughs> So I wouldn't write off Adam and Eve because some scientific study seems to suggest that the smallest population could be 10,000 people. Um, although other Christian theologians might say, even if that were the case, God breathed into those two, Adam and Eve, uh, a, a humanity of some kind. And that, that from that point on, that those were the first two human beings. Um, but it's all speculation to a certain extent. Kay. And I would look up Craig's book and see what you get out of that. Okay, so y you, you say breathed into two people. Do you mean like breathed into a population that was larger than that and then they kind of called that Adam and Eve or do you mean actually two people? I'm just saying some of these other theories I've heard by other Christians. Mm -hmm. Like there was a, a group of a hominids prior to that and then Adam and Eve were the first two. I don't think that's the solution. I'm just saying this is what other people are saying. I think God created Adam and Eve out of the dust, just like it says. But people trying to shoehorn these studies into an explanation might say something like that. Okay. What but was the I name of that book I don't, again? I don't think these studies are definitive is what I'm saying. Okay. What right. was the name of that book again? It's called The Historical Adam. Okay. By, I think it's called The Historical Adam. In Quest of the Historical Adam. <coughs> Just look for William Lane Craig, you'll find it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Frank Turek. Yeah, please don't honor. touch the mic. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Don't touch the mic. Yeah. Don't touch it. <laughs> Stop touching me. What's your name? <laughs> uh, my name is Mark. Hey, Mark. Go ahead, sir. Um, it is an honor to hear you speak, and thank you for coming out today. Thank you. My question today is, is seeing that there are a good amount of religions that follow a similar pattern on how they address the following points that is pertaining to the Bible. They don't believe in the Trinity. Um, they say the Bible has been corrupted, and obviously you answered today um, that Jesus Christ has resurrected, but a lot of them believe him as being only a prophet. And maybe pertaining specifically to Mormonism, uh, what would be your best argument on why the Trinity is a biblical view compared to the Mormon belief in a plurality of gods and the concept of exaltation? And in your view, are Mormons a Christian denomination? Thank you. I know <laughs> that is a pretty heavy uh, I think question. we're out of time. What do you guys think? <laughs> but do your best to answer that. First of all, as I understand Mormonism, Mormonism is not monotheistic. It's polytheistic. I see. There are many gods. And as man is, God once was. And... Mormons believe that a faithful Mormon man will one day become a god of his own planet. Now, if, I'm, if I got that wrong, let me know, but that's as I understand Mormonism. Now, it doesn't mean every Mormon believes this. Just like every Baptist might, might not believe the theology that the Baptist church officially believes. But Mormons are not monotheists, they're polytheists. Now, the Trinity is not polytheistic, it's three persons in one divine essence. All right, and that actually solves problems for me rather than creates problems because if you have a lover, a loved one, and a spirit of love in the Godhead, then you can have love from all eternity. You don't need to create anything. God is love from the very beginning. Uh, but Mormons are not a Christian denomination in a traditional sense because they're polytheistic, and of course Christianity is monotheistic. And secondly, Christianity is a worldview that believes in grace as the means to salvation, whereas Mormons believe you get grace and then you got to do more good works. All right, so, and there are many other differences, but no, they, they would not be a traditional denomination like, say, Baptists or Lutherans or Presbyterians because they have a completely different Godhead. And uh, you can, you know, look this kind of stuff up. In fact, we have a course, an online course, called Conversations with the Face. And we have an expert that teaches people about Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Islam. 
So if you want to go further in that, his name is Brady Blevins. If you go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses, you could see it there. What was uh, that course again? It's called Conversations with the Faiths. Okay. You know? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Great question. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Frank. My name is Elias. Uh, first, hey, Elias. thanks for uh, coming out. I appreciate it. Um, yes, sir. So I was an atheist up until about four years ago when I came to Christ. And Excellent. Uh, now, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the past year or so, I've been really studying uh, how to do apologetics to atheists and so I could kind of help people out of the same boat that I was in because sure. at the time I thought I had good objections and mm -hmm. now I know I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem I'm facing, um, especially here more so compared to California, surprisingly, because I'm sure, as you probably know, uh, you're faced with a lot of uh, aggressive opposition in places like that, um, whereas the wall I'm kind of running into here is just indifference and disinterest, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is not something I could ever wrap my head around. Like even as an atheist, I was actively searching for what is the truth, what is the meaning of life. Okay. Um, and I just, I don't know, how do I get people to care about the most important question in the world if I can even do that? Well, my mentor, Dr. Norman Geiser, was once asked the question, what's the greatest problem in America today? Is it ignorance or apathy? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get people to care? Um, if I knew that, first of all, everyone would be saved, and second of all, I'd be a billionaire because <laughs> I could get people to care. Getting people to care is hard. That's why I always ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they hesitate or say no, it's not a head problem, it's a heart problem. What can you do with people who don't really care? There are four things you can do, probably more than four, but these are the four I can think of. Number one, you can pray. You should always pray. In fact, let me ask you guys a question in here for those who are Christians. How many of you in here have been praying for somebody for years and they came to faith. Does anyone have people like that? Okay, look around the room. Look, like 20% of us are saying, yeah, I prayed for somebody for a long time and they eventually came to faith. Okay, so pray, number one. Number two, plant seeds every now and then. Okay, not all the time, but plant seeds that point out that what they believe is false and what Christianity says is true. Number three, you can love them. That doesn't mean you approve of everything they do, as we said earlier. And then number four, you can wait. Why wait? Because everybody is at a different place in their spiritual journey, and we shouldn't expect people to agree with us. In fact, sometimes people say, Frank, you know, you go to a lot of college campuses, and sometimes the students are rude, and how come you don't get mad at them? I say, like, why would I? Look, I'm 62 years old. When I was 22, I didn't agree with my 62-year-old self. So why should I expect someone who's 22 to agree with me now? I shouldn't. And why should you expect everybody you know to agree with how you believe right now? You didn't even agree with you five years ago, did you? <laughs> because people change. We're in process. So have patience with people. Now, if somebody who doesn't care suddenly comes to care, most often, it's through tragedy. And tragedy strikes all of us at some point. And if that's the case, that person may call your phone and they'll be on the other end. They're going to call you a person of spiritual depth when that happens. They're not going to call their atheist friend. What's the atheist friend going to say? There's no rhyme or reason to any of this. Stuff just happens. Too bad. Get over it, right? They're going to call you. Now, sometimes you only look up when you're on your back. So I would recommend those four things uh, because people are at different levels of interest and different places in their spiritual journey, and they might not be interested now, but at some point they might be. So just stay in their lives. Awesome. Right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. You, what's your name? Uh, my name is Steez. Steez, go ahead. Uh, so I don't know if it's going to be a short answer or not, but... When talking, witnessing to someone about uh, the New Testament and they bring up it's been changed, it's not reliable, or uh -huh. it's, dating's not early, what would be kind of like a, a, a source we could send them to or something I could quickly say just to abstract? Okay, when later. somebody says the New Testament documents are late, let's say, it's not your job to refute what they say, it's their job to support what they say. So say, what, what do you mean by that? Why, why do you think they're late? And what evidence do you have that they are late? And what do you mean by late? 
how, you know, are you, are you because there was, where was I last time? At Buffalo. Some kid set up and said, oh, these were written after 100 AD. There's like virtually no scholar that believes that. But he saw it on the internet. So it's got to be true. <laughs> right? Ask the person for evidence. And my friend Greg Coco wrote a great book called Tactics, which you should get to have conversations with people. And he recommends three questions. First question, what do you mean by that? What do, what do you mean they were written late? How late? Number two, how did you come to that conclusion? In other words, what evidence do you have for that position? Most people don't have evidence. They just heard a slogan. And they like what the slogan says. If you ask them for evidence, they don't have any evidence. And then number three, you might say, have you ever considered that the newest study on the ages of the New Testament documents puts the Gospel of Mark in the 40s, and all of Paul's letters we know had to be written by 65 or so when he was killed, because I don't know about you, but you have to write before you die. Um, and uh, I would argue, if you look at the evidence, that just about every book in the New Testament, maybe all of them are written prior to 70 AD. And it's not just when the books were written, it's the sources upon which the books relied to be written. Like, for example, if I were to say um, right now that I'm going to write a book about 9-11, which was just over 22 years ago, and I started interviewing people in New York right now, and tell me what happened. And I, I got all these sources. Does it matter that I wrote it 22 years later? No, because I'm actually getting back to the event itself because the event that took place was so dramatic, it's seared into the memories that the people that went through it, it's called an impact event, that even though I'm writing it 22 years later, the source material is from the event itself. The same thing is true with the New Testament. The source material where people say, this is what Jesus said, this is what Jesus did, Jesus rose from the dead, all this, that source material goes back to the event itself. Even atheistic scholars are admitting this, like Bart Ehrman from UNC Chapel Hill says the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the earliest evidence for the resurrection, where it says, Paul writes down for what I received, I'm passing on to you now, and it says to everybody Jesus, to whom Jesus appeared to. That creed, that's a, that was something memorized orally because it was, it's put into a rhythmic form. All those people mentioned in there as being eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ are in that creed, and that creed, even Ehrman and others admit, goes back to the event itself, within a year or two, if that. So despite the fact that 1 Corinthians is written in 55 AD, which is 22 years after the event, the same distance between us and 9-11, the source goes all the way back to the event itself. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. All right, thanks, Dees. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir, go ahead. Anyways. Um, What's your name? Caesar. My name Caesar. is Caesar. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a, a pretty cool job. I teach uh, Bible classes to public school students. Good. And I've been doing that for about five years, and I've noticed a shift with my students. I kind of wanted to ask your perspective on a national level. So the first couple years, uh, I've noticed that I had a lot of atheists take my class, but now the like the last two years, I've noticed that it's, it's less atheist and more spiritually curious. Okay. So is that, am I in a bubble and am I just seeing like that's what's happening in my community or do you notice that same shift nationwide? Well, I, I, don't, have the, I don't have the perspective of nationwide. I only have the perspective of where I go. Yeah. And so I do notice that people seem to be interested in this material now, more so than say 20 years ago. More people are interested in the moral questions than anything else. Yeah. Um, and I think people, due to the fact that the world seems to be getting more and more chaotic, are beginning to look for stability. Even people like Joe Rogan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even people like Jordan Peterson. Uh, people like, uh, who's the guy, JP? Who's the guy, the YouTube guy? Oh, with the yeah, spiritual guy. Sears. JP Sears? You know, some of these YouTubers, they're, they're, not, they're not Christians, but suddenly they're going. In fact, JP, that guy said, I'm seeing so much evil, it's starting to scare me, you know, that maybe there is a God out there. How is all this happening? So when things start turning toward the demonic, people start waking up. 
And so that may be a good outcome of that. And I had just one more question yeah, real quick about Matthew in theme of the eclipse, right? Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 34, where it says that, truly I say to you, these signs that he gives, uh -huh. uh, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Mm -hmm. So a, quite, a student asked me that question a year ago, and I've been still wrestling with it, and I kind of want to know if you had any input on that. Yeah, that's an in interesting passage that Christians uh, interpret differently. I'll give you my interpretation, and we actually have a YouTube video on this on our YouTube channel, but here's the short answer. When Jesus says all these things will occur before, uh, before this event takes place, when did he say that? He said that about 30, 33 AD. What's a generation? 40 years? Yeah. He said it in, uh, 40 years would take you up to about 70 AD. What happened yeah. in 70 AD? Yeah, the fall of Jerusalem. Okay, yeah. the fall of Jerusalem. And if you look at the passage in Luke, it says, Jesus says, when you see armies descending on Jerusalem, yeah. flee to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jesus is only talking about the end of the universe, what sense would it make to say flee to the mountains? Yeah. It wouldn't make any sense. There's always a short-term fulfillment to these prophecies and then a long-term fulfillment. When Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until these things occur, he was talking about the short term, the 70 AD judgment, and when it says, you will see the Son of Man coming with power in the clouds. In the Old Testament, Yahweh wrote a cloud in judgment. Look at Isaiah 19.1, okay? Jesus is quoting from Isaiah several times. In fact, he's quoting from Isaiah 13 when he says something like, I don't have it exactly, but he says, the moon will fail to give its light, the yeah. stars will fall from the sky and all this. Well, you know what Isaiah 13 is referring to? He's referring to the fall of Babylon, okay. which already occurred. It's not a literal falling of the stars from the sky. It's an apocalyptic way of saying it's going to be a terrible time. So when Jesus says that in the context of 70 AD, he's saying the same kind of thing. It's going to be a terrible time. Now, that's the short-term fulfillment. The longer-term fulfillment he is talking about when he comes again. So in order for people to know Jesus was a true prophet, he's going to give them a short-term prophecy where they'll know, oh, that came true, and he must be right about the long-term as well. All right, good. All Thank right. you. I appreciate it. All right, it. thanks. Yes, sir. How's it going, Frank? Hey, good. Todd, um, right? Yeah. Hey, go ahead. Um, I just forgot my question. Uh, oh, I'm having trouble um, understanding um, how people before Christ were judged, specifically, like, if Christ's death, death was sufficient for past, present, and future sins. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't understand how past sins could be forgiven if, they'd, if they had already been judged. Well, because Christ... Christ sacrifice was retroactive to the people that lived prior to him. In fact, Paul even says the gospel is preached to Abraham. Mm -hmm. The people who in the Old Testament were saved by the blood of Christ, even though the blood of Christ in time hadn't happened yet, looking forward to his crucifixion. Whereas the people now are looking backward toward Christ's crucifixion. But his sacrifice saves everybody. But the people in the Old Testament didn't know the name of Jesus. The people, of course, in the New do know the name of Jesus. So his sacrifice affects everybody throughout time, even though it happened 1,991 years ago. So was it that their sins were just like kind of push, moved forward in a What's way? That? Was it that their sins were like pushed forward in a way? Like obviously you're not God and you weren't there when they faced him How do you face know? to face. <laughs> But, like, when they saw God face to face and, and they were judged based off of their faith. Well, like Paul it, does say in Romans chapter 3, man, I'm getting tired. Um, <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, that means it's like 1130 my time. Um, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, because, you know, I could be that old. <laughs> I could be. Um, he says in Romans chapter 3 that God overlooked passed over the sins previously committed. What does that make you think of? Passed over? Passover. Yeah, pass over the sins previously committed. So, but now he calls all men to repent. So in a sense, he passed over the sins in the Old Testament, but they're still saved by the blood of Christ. In fact, those people were with Jesus, two of them in the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. They're alive. 
they appear with Jesus before he's ever crucified, right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank All right. You. Thanks, Ty. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, I've been watching you for a while now. I'm getting new to evangel evangelism. Uh-huh which recently started in my church, and I'm starting to grow at that. Mm -hmm. So I just had a question. Um, do you have any, like, tips on how to evangelize in high school? Because I'm going to a public high school, mm. and I've been wanting to spread the word, but I don't want to put too much pressure right. on the people that I'm talking to to where they just turn away from it blankly right there. I think one of the things we need to remember that evangelism is not an event. It's a process. It's not, I got to talk to this person right now and get the person to accept Christ. Yeah. It's a process. It's more like gardening rather than harvesting. Mm -hmm. Harvesting happens every now and then, but most of the time you're planting seeds. So Paul says, some plant, some water, God brings the increase. Just be friendly with people okay. and learn what they believe and why. And maybe ask them some questions to see where they're coming from. And maybe ask them, hey, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about Jesus? Yeah. And see what they say. All right. And maybe even ask them, if Jesus really rose from the dead to prove he was God, would you follow him? You know, once you're friends with him. Yeah. And this may take months or even years. right? Just be friendly with people and move them along incrementally. Plant seeds every now and then. And then ask questions to learn what people believe. Look, I've noticed that people don't mind talking about what they believe if you just ask them. Right? Talk about them, in other words. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. And yeah. thanks for wanting to evangelize your friends. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I have a quick question. What's your name? So, Davin. Gavin, go ahead. Davin. Davin, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a lot of Mormon friends who, like, they say that we're like the same and we believe in the same thing, okay. but we don't. Mm -hmm. And like I point out the differences, but then they just shrug it off. So what should I say to them? I think you should say we're all adults here. <laughs> Mr. Poopy Pants. <laughs> um, I think you should say, um, why do you think these differences are not important? Because if Jesus, if, if Orthodox Christianity, historic Christianity, has the right Jesus, and Jesus is the Savior of the world, and Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, if anybody preaches another gospel, may that person be accursed, then you're in serious trouble as a Mormon. Yeah. Okay? If that's true. The question, is it true? And that's what we're trying to show here it is. Because God's not going to force anybody into heaven against their will. Uh, so I would just try and point out to them that, and ask them, are you going to follow the truth wherever it leads? Because yeah. look, it, let's be honest. It's, it's a very high cost for Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Muslims to leave their faith. Mormons will be disfellowshipped. They won't be on the inside. Uh, so will Jehovah's Witnesses. Muslims may even be killed for leaving Islam. So it's a really high cost to walk away from any of those belief systems. And you might want to ask yourself, why would those belief systems put those kind of draconian penalties on people? Why do they have to threaten disfellowshipping and maybe even death? Good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Why is that? Why, when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your house, they won't take any literature from you? That's because it's not the truth. Well, how do they know? <laughs> See, they've been brainwashed to think only their mm -hmm. watchtower has the truth. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there, there's uh, ex-Mormons like Sandra Tanner, who is in the bloodline of Brigham Young, who has exposed how many errors there have been in the Book of, in, in the Book of Mormon and how often it's been changed. So, um, I think her website, does anyone know what Sandra Tanner's website is? Um, anyway, look up Sandra Tanner, you'll find her. So that might be a way through and say, look, if it really were true that Orthodox Christianity is true, would you be interested in at least investigating it? And then go to Sandra Tanner's website 
for the problems with Mormonism, and then you can go to our website or other websites to talk about the evidence for Christianity. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> yes, what's your name? Uh, hello, I'm Elizabeth. Hey, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm a Christian, and I've studied apologetics. Get a little close was... to the microphone, if you oh, would. Go ahead. I don't know if I can reach it. Okay, um, you're close enough. Go ahead. Um, I've studied apologetics since before I was even in school. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, because of that, I enjoy playing devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. um, so earlier you said that Jesus is, that God is infinitely just, which I yeah. totally agree with. But um, just as a question, um, why would an infinitely just God punish in it a perfect, innocent being like Jesus on the cross? Because Jesus volunteered to be our substitute. He wasn't forced onto the cross. This is why the so-called progressive Christians who are neither progressive nor Christian, because you're not progressing when you're disagreeing with Jesus, and you're not a Christian if you're disagreeing with Jesus. This is why they're wrong when they say that the cross was divine child abuse. Jesus volunteered to be our punishment, to take our punishment. When Michael Monsor dove on that grenade voluntarily... Was that good or bad? It's good. That was good because he sacrificed himself to save his friends. That's what Jesus did for us. In fact, the only difference is he didn't sacrifice himself to save his friends. He sacrificed himself to save his enemies. Mm -hmm. That's all of us. So, yeah, I would say if God forced Jesus to the cross, that would be one thing, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. Jesus volunteered to go. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Tassin. Tassin, go ahead. Um, so I have an atheist, or I should say agnostic friend. Um, mm -hmm. He basically has problem with any kind of scripture or religion. Uh, so when asking questions about God and religion, one of the concerns he has, he tends to make this about very personal about himself, meaning if... Jesus died, and all these witnesses witnessed this death and resurrection. They got to witness it. Uh, but why can't that happen today? Why can't someone, some prophet can raise people from the dead today so that I can see it? And, of course, I mean, you can point to the fact that Jesus said, blessed are those who didn't see but still believe. Uh, but he goes back to the fact that a Bible is written by some guy. It could be a myth. And... So what kind of approach would you recommend in that kind of situation? Well, first of all, I might ask him how many things he believes that he hasn't seen. Probably a lot. Yeah, <laughs> right. In fact, most of the things we believe in, we haven't seen. We take it on authority, right? Um, and so he's, his own worldview, uh, he believes many things that he hasn't seen evidence for, but he believes them anyway. Now, the passage you just mentioned in John chapter 20, after Jesus shows himself to Thomas and he says, blessed are those who uh, haven't seen and yet believed, he's not saying they don't have evidence because the very next verse, John says this, these things were written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Savior and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. In other words, the whole book of John is written as evidence as to why Jesus is the Savior, and therefore you then can make a decision to follow him. Uh, you can look at the evidence like we've been doing here to see would they have made this up? Why would they have made it up? Why is Jesus of Nazareth the most influential human being in history if he didn't rise from the dead? I mean, he comes from an obscure par part of the Roman Empire, he was just an itinerant preacher who didn't travel more than 200 miles from where he lived. He never wrote a book. He never led an army. He never held office. He never did many of the things that would, from the ancient times, cause you to remember him. And yet now he's the center of the human race. Why is that? Because he rose from the dead. That's why. And the evidence, in fact, the, the alternative theories for this are evaporating. People don't have good alternative theories for explaining all the data. They just say, we don't know what happened to Jesus, but we're not going to say he rose from the dead. Also, I might say that when people say, I would believe if I only saw with my own eyes, I don't buy that. In fact, even in history, you look back at 
let's just say the, uh, the uh, folks at the Exodus. They saw miracle after miracle, and then Moses goes up on the mountains for an extra few nights, and suddenly they're worshiping the golden calf. And you're going, what? <laughs> In other words, miracles didn't always bring forth the kind of, of fidelity to, to Jesus or to God that you would think they would. And uh, there are atheists today. In fact, uh, it's uh, Peter Atkins who's an Oxford-trained, I think, biologist who was asked recently on the Unbelievable Bo podcast with Justin Briley. He's having a debate with you, Ross. And uh, you, Ross, was giving him evidence that God exists and all this, and he was just having none of it. And so Justin Briley turned to him and said, what if Jesus appeared to you? Would you believe then? He said, no, I'd see my psychiatrist, <laughs> right? It's like there's nothing that can convince some people. So I think God gives people enough evidence to believe, but he also gives them enough distance so they can go their own way. If God were to show up to us all the time like a stalker, would we really be freed if we wanted to ignore him and go our own way? No. He gives us enough evidence, but not overwhelming. That's why C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tapes letter says, God cannot ravish he can only woo he can only uh, give evidence that isn't overwhelming so you still have freedom to go your own way all right make sense thank you all right thank you <laughs> yes sir go ahead Hello, um, I was wondering, I've heard this uh, objection before uh -huh. that we believe that the, that the apostles weren't lying because they just never recanted their faith even in the face of death. But I guess I've just heard this common objection that uh, just that they, they didn't and that... They didn't what? They didn't, re that they didn't recant or they didn't, did not, mm, <laughs> that they that they uh, didn't actually die for their faith and because some of these, I guess, Thomas, it's not actually, you know, in the Bible. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah I see what you're see saying. What okay, saying. well, the, the, the newest research on that was done by Dr. Sean McDowell in his doctoral, doctrinal dissertation maybe seven, eight years ago. It's called The Fate of the Apostles. You can get it on Amazon. Here's what Sean will say. Out of the 11 remaining apostles, four of them we have very good first century evidence for that they literally died for their faith. And then the next group of three or four, we have okay evidence, but not super great evidence. And for the last few, we don't really have good evidence, but there's no evidence from the ancient world that anybody ever recanted. Now the top four are Peter, Paul, James, the half-brother of Jesus, and James, the brother of John. We have first century evidence for those people dying for their faith. In fact, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is thrown off the Temple Mount by the Sanhedrin in 62 AD, and then he's stoned to death. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us this. It's not even in the New Testament. And he was probably in Jerusalem at the time because he lived from 37 AD to about 100 AD. And uh, so there's another writer, Hegesippus, who also talks about that event. He's basically the pastor of the church in Jerusalem 30 years after his brother is alleged to have risen from the dead. Now, why would he be dying for his brother claiming to be God if his brother didn't rise from the dead? Doesn't make any sense. All right, so... I would ask those people who say that, why are you saying that there's no evidence? What evidence do you have that uh, denies the evidence that does say that they did die for their faith? And uh, just see where that goes. All right. All right. Actually, uh, do you happen to know uh, why Ruth didn't like Joshua? Ruth didn't like Joshua. I think it was because Joshua judges Ruth. <laughs> that's like that's like bible geek dad jokes isn't that bible geek dad jokes that was good i like that all right yes go ahead hi uh my name is also frank um frank <laughs> 
Did you used to work with uh, Don Blythe? No. No, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm a Christian, and I think um, sometimes when having conversations about hot topic issues, especially mm -hmm. in today's society, you know, mm -hmm. gender and sexuality and all, all the other, there's a lot of them right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it's a lot of conversations quickly devolve into sort of, you know, you're not being loving, you're not be, you're being judgmental, that kind of thing. And I guess the, the do you, do you the, ask them why you're judging me for judging? I have not. <laughs> All right, go ahead. But I guess the the difficulty is like, I feel like there's a temptation to sort of let it be a little bit, so you could try to work on like getting across I guess the love of Jesus before I guess how do you approach that because it's such a important thing and there is right and wrong and it is black and white and there is well maybe you should hear them out first and hear why they believe what they believe why do they think they're right and what is the moral standard upon which they are basing their beliefs that's why I said earlier there are people out there claiming they have all sorts of rights but they're atheists there are no rights if there's no God Everything's a matter of opinion, yet they're acting like they have a right to a certain thing. So ask them, why? Where, do you, where are you getting this from? And what is the purpose of life? If there's no purpose to life, there are no, there's not a right way to live it or a wrong way to live it. It's just your opinion. So that's why in our book, Stealing from God, it's not up here, but Stealing from God, I noticed that people are stealing moral standards from God in order to justify their lifestyle when, in fact, they're atheists. So they don't have a moral standard. And so I would just ask questions and try and learn why they believe what they believe. Probably it's going to be, at the foundation, incoherent. They're not going to have justification. They haven't thought it through that far. So you can just keep asking questions. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Why do you think that's true? Ironically, people who are claiming they have certain sexual rights and they're claiming for equality and they're claiming they have a right to this and a right to that are using the Christian worldview of equality, these kinds of values that don't exist in other worldviews to say that they should have a certain right to do something even though it's against the Christian scriptures. So they're stealing the values of Christianity to try and advance their rights that don't really exist in a Christian world. So you might want to point that out. In fact, there are atheists now, highfalutin atheists or non-Christians like Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man guy, the, the historian from the UK, and Douglas Murray who identifies as a gay atheist. Guys like him, or like them, are saying, even though I don't believe in Christianity, and even Richard Dawkins just said this this week. I'm a cultural Christian. The values that Christianity brings to civilization, I want. And I'm more Christian than I am anything else, just due to the Christian values. So you might want to just drill down on where they're getting their rights from. Does that make sense, Frank? Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is the final question. Sorry, because we got to be out of here by 10. All right. Sorry, guys. We can talk maybe as we're wrapping up. Go ahead. Last question. Hi. So my name is Caleb, and yeah. I, started a, I started a Bible study in my public school, uh -huh. and they've, it's actually grown really fast, and we received a little bit of flack from the school, but God took care of us, and now they're wanting to go out and do an evangelize, like evangelize, uh -huh. but there's some people that I don't feel like are ready yet like they're newer in their faith i'm wondering yeah. how do i tell that and if how would i like word that to them or let them know that okay uh, my friend jay warner wallace the guy i had up here earlier has a saying that he says to uh people who are training youth don't teach youth train youth mm -hmm. and what that means is you ought to train them for doing evangelism don't just teach them the principles of it say okay you know a month from now, we're going to go out on the campus of wherever, and we're going to take surveys of people and get into conversations and try and see if we can tell them the truth about Jesus, right? And we're going to have to answer their objections. If there's an event that they want to train for, 
they're going to take it a lot more seriously than if you just say, hey, here's how you can evangelize people, but there's nothing to train for. It's kind of like a heavyweight fighter, right? If there's a fight coming up, he's going to be training. If there's no fight coming up, he might not train at all. If there's an event coming up that they don't want to be embarrassed at, then they're going to learn the material. So put an event on the calendar and say, now, if you want to be good at doing this, we're going to have to train for it. And because you don't want to be embarrassed, you don't want to represent Christ poorly when we go do this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to ask the right questions and, and maybe answer some of the common objections. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Folks, thanks so much for being here. Hope to see you again. God bless.